I love my mind maps and it would be cool if we could create mind maps in PowerShell. <laughs> That's a great question. I think I tried mind maps, but I'm going to let Ashley go through his thing and then we can ask him questions as we go along. Feel free to drop those questions into the chat. I'll keep an eye on that. Um, and at the end, we'll have Q&A if there's any more. Um, so we know that we're going to talk about mind maps at some point. So Ashley, you're, you're up. Cool. Hey, everyone. I'm Ashley. Um, thank you for having me. I'm going to talk about Mermaid. I think Doug teed it up nicely. Um, it's, a, it's a tool to create diagrams. We're going to go through a little bit of history of diagramming, why I think it's important, why I think you should use it if you're not. And then we'll talk about the tools that you can use, um, one of them being, being Mermaid. So a little bit about me first. Um, Ashley Peacock, I'm a staff software engineer here in the UK. So if it looks very dark on my screen, it's because it's uh, approaching midnight in the UK. So I've pumped myself full of coffee. Hopefully, uh, I'll keep it going to the end. Um, I have 10 years of in industry experience. If you include the tinkering around when I was a teenager, uh, it's more like 15. But I'm uh, kind of PHP, MySQL, the kind of classic style stack. Um, an avid believer in the, the power of a diagram, as you're, you're soon going to learn. And uh, yeah, spare time, I like to play video games, I like to rock climb. If you want to talk to me about anything software engineering, I'm always happy to chat. So you can catch me on Twitter. You can drop me an email. Those details will be there at the end. And um, of course, mermaid diagramming, always happy to talk. So diagramming in 2023. Diagramming has been around for a long time, probably 70s, 80s, 90s. Everyone was, you know, that's where it started. But it's come a long way since since then. You may have heard of things like UML that we'll talk about. It, it got a bit of a bad rep for a while because it was very time consuming, but things like Mermaid are here now to, to speed that up and make it a lot more accessible for, for everyone and just a lot more enjoyable to use, really. So before we talk about tools and languages and all the things like that, I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think you should diagram, because I think the reason of why is almost as important as, as the how. So it allows you to kind of quickly convey, um, quickly and efficiently convey information that you need to to everyone. Um, I'm sure you've been in a situation where you've asked someone, how does this work? Or do you have any information on this thing? And they send you a huge Word document, you know, it's hundreds of words, thousands of words long, paragraph after paragraph. Um, and one of three things probably happens. One, you kind of suck it up and read it. More likely, you kind of, I'm really bad at saying like a Slack notification to remind me to do it tomorrow. And then I snooze that until I kind of have to read it. Um, or you land somewhere in the middle where you skim read it. You probably don't get all the information you want or need. And at that point, really no one's happy. And if you compare that to a diagram or even just anything visual, I guarantee in that situation, the diagram, the visual aid is going to be a lot easier to read and digest than just a wall of text. In my kind of career, I've experienced this quite a lot. So it got to the point where I got quite kind of almost like famous in my company for it, where people would, I would go to meetings and people would expect me to turn up with a diagram, which I didn't always have available uh, most of the time, but it kind of got to the point where people found them so useful and so powerful and it helped them learn, helped the meeting, and you know, they just wanted that. So they wanted the diagram. Um, it pushed my career forward. Um, so particularly from senior to staff is quite a big jump. And I had to do tick, tick a lot of boxes. And diagramming helped tick a lot of those boxes. For example, it gives you visibility. Um, things like architecture, um, architecture design records, for example, if you're making architect changes, including diagrams in those are going to go um, a long way. And it even got to the point where my kind of CTO was mentioning the diagrams I was making, and that's, that really helped push my, my career forward. And finally, like a lot of skills, it's, it's a teachable skill. Um, I've seen brand new software engineers that are like mentors in boot camps, and I've taught them how to do diagrams, and they've kind of picked it up, they've run with it, and it's it's just super easy to pick up, and it's not like a programming language where there's a huge list of things to learn. It's very simple, but it's super powerful. So who can make use of diagrams? 
it is. I mean, at the bottom, you can see, I think it's it's anyone, but we're obviously specifically talking about software here. So software architects, sorry, software engineers, architects. Um, I've had product managers, as we'll talk about in later slides, use it. Uh, test engineers or QA, I've seen them use it. Even recently, I've been emailing with um, someone who bought the book. He's not, he's an IT support, and he's now using that um, to kind of automate some of the, the documentation he's doing. So I think use cases diagrams are, are pretty much pretty endless. So before we get into kind of mermaid and tools, we kind of understand stand where diagramming in software engineering came from. So I'm going to go for a brief history, I'm not going to spend too long because it's, it's not a history talk, but I think it's important to understand kind of where it came from. I'm sure most of you will have heard of UML, but if anyone hasn't, uh, it stands for the kind of unified modeling language. And it's basically a standard set of diagrams that you can use to visualize and structure the design of the system. So the one on your screen uh, is a class diagram. So you have you know, an account class, an address book class. The diagram explains how they interact with each other. So the account uses the address book and the address book is accessed by account. And if you, these are the properties of the class and these are the, the methods. This is just one of the diagrams, class diagram. There are other ones like component diagrams or deployment diagrams. And those are called structural. So they represent the kind of physical things, if you like. And you have more behavioral ones that don't represent things like classes or components. They represent things like sequences or activities or use cases. It was actually introduced in the, the 90s. So it's been around for a while. And I think it's one of the reasons diagramming gets a bit of a bad rep is the amount. Um, mainly because a lot of people get stuck up on notation and how it looks in the same way that, you know, you have program conversations about know, tabs versus spaces, for example, where I don't want to, you know, the chat to blow up with the tabs versus spaces conversations, but in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter too much. Same with notation. It's about the information that you are kind of conveying, not the kind of tool you're using. For a long time, there was just UML, and the vast majority of people would have been creating those diagrams painstakingly slowly by hand. And then in recent years, tools have come along to speed up the creation of those diagrams. So on the screen, you have plan UML, and it's basically like, you can make it like a DSL or simple markdown for creating diagrams. On the left, you have the text that creates the diagram. And then on the right, you have the kind of render diagram. So there's an engine that takes the text, generates the lines, the boxes, and so forth. Um, it's released in 2009, so obviously that's a big gap between UML and Plan UML, about 20 years before there was some sort of automation to make this all simpler. But it did fill that gap of now you could generate diagrams using Markdown or Markdown-like syntax, and it saved you drawing it all manually. Within UML, there's about 15 types of diagram. And Plant UML supports all those ones I just talked about. So class sequence, you can create them all using Plant UML. One of the big selling points is the creation of the diagram is much quicker because it's much easier to write you know, a couple of words, a couple of hyphens, and it render that box rather than you dragging them around. And similarly, if you make a mistake or you present it to someone, and they say, this is, this is wrong, or this needs to change. If you've got hundreds of boxes, it's going to take you maybe hours to redraw those diagrams, redraw those lines. Whereas with Plant UML, a few changes, it's, it's, it's going to take you, you know, minutes rather than hours. The main problem with Plant UML, and it, it did gain some adoption, and the reason it hasn't gone as mainstream as Mermaid, for example, um, is it's written in Java. And I don't have a problem with Java. I think these days it's a perfectly nice language to write in, but it's not very web friendly. So if you want to render 
what do you want to take this text and to generate this diagram? You need to install Java, you need to run the JVM. And that just doesn't really run on the web. So if you fast forward to Mermaid, um, we'll look at some of the syntax from Mermaid in a minute. It's quite similar to Python ML. Um, but this diagram here was, was generated using Mermaid. And it's very similar to Python ML. The syntax is very similar. It supports pretty much the same types of diagram. Um, Mermaid's kind of cherry picked which diagrams from UML it wants to support, mainly because the vast majority of them are not used commonly. I would say I use maybe three or four from UML out of the 15. So I think it's picked the main ones and supported those, but it does constantly add new ones. And it doesn't just support UML. So I'll talk about some other types of diagram later on. But for example, C4 diagrams for architecture, you can use simple diagrams like pie charts, uh, Git graph. Uh, we talked about mind maps at the start, so I mentioned mind maps. You can do mind maps in Mermaid. Um, I haven't got any screenshots in here, but you, you, uh, you can do mind maps. Or even just timelines for things like, you know, like Gantt charts, for example, you can have those. So Ashley, on that note, somebody else also said they love uh, tree diagrams being an Active Directory person. What um, anything about tree diagrams off the top of your head? Tree, tree diagrams like I'm going to like <laughs> <laughs> I was I was going to assume like you know laying out a directory folder for example something like that. I'm Jim. Do you have any want to refine that statement a little bit? Or we can get back to that. So let's move on. We'll get we'll get back to trees and yeah. all that good stuff. Cool. Um, the main difference between, or the main reason why I think Mermaid has got the adoption it's got, is it's written in JavaScript, um, which you might not like JavaScript, but it does run literally these days everywhere. So it can run in the client in your browser. It can run on the, the server side. Um, there's a CLI that you'll be very uh, happy to hear. Um, and it's just got really widespread product option that I'll talk about later that I think makes it super, 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 super powerful, way more powerful than Plant UML um, ever was. So we're going to look at some Mermaid examples. I'm going to go through three. There's uh, lots more in the book. Um, but I want to highlight kind of the probably three of the most common ones I guess I use. Um, this is a C4 diagram. So some of you may have seen it. It's it's really popular these days for describing, documenting your architecture. So on the, the right-hand side, you have the, the diagram that is rendered. And on the left, you have a snippet of the mermaid markup that was used to generate it. Um, so if you look at this kind of little block here, this is describing the box in the bottom right. So it's just got a shorthand name, SS, short for search service. And then it has, just has some description in the box. So you can write anything in here. Um, you can put emojis in here. You can do whatever you like. And then you basically use the shorthand names to draw the lines between the boxes. So this is user, you know, views titles, and so on between the user and the listing service. And this will render this um, line here. And as you can imagine, creating this diagram, um, you could do it in, in, a, in a few minutes. Taking a step back, just to explain what the C4 model is, if anyone not familiar, um, it's, as I said, it's a, a model for documenting and describing your architecture. And it, as the name suggests, it gives you four different views of your architecture. So the one you can see is the system context, which is like the 50,000 foot view. Um, it doesn't include technical details. It just kind of describes the use of the system, your, the system that you're kind of focusing on for your architecture, because the C4 model focuses on one kind of system and then any of its dependencies. Um, and as you can see, there's nothing about protocols or anything in here. It's just super high level. I don't have the other diagrams in here, but essentially you can think of the C4 model like zooming in each time. So if you were to then go to the next diagram, which is a, called a container diagram, which has nothing to do with Docker, and the kind of predated Docker, you then zoom on, zoom in on all the kind of single deployable units that make up, in this case, the listing service. So you might have a .NET Core web app that is responsible for rendering the, you know, the front office and so on. Um, and you might have a Redis instance and you might have Postgres and so on. 
And when you zoom in, you can see how those, con those containers all kind of fit together. And then if you were to zoom in again on each container, you get what's called a component diagram, which shows the high level modules in your kind of, in your code. And then if you want to go really far in, you can do the code, which is the, the classes that make up the modules. The guy who created this, Simon Brown, um, he generally recommends only creating the kind of top two, so the context and the container diagram, purely because things like modules and classes are just subject to rapid change, often in the code base, so they get rapidly outdated. And a diagram that's out of date is almost kind of worse than having no diagram at all, because it's going to lead people down the wrong path or give them wrong information. The only exception is if you're working on a monolith, then I don't think the container diagram that just shows one web app, for example, is representative of your architecture. So in that case, I would do um, a component diagram that shows the kind of high level building blocks that make up the monolith. That's a simple model. Next one is probably my favorite. Um, I tried to pick favorites, but this one is, is probably my favorite if I had to pick one. And it is a, um, it's a, sequ it's a sequence diagram. And this one is from UML. So C4 is not from UML. Um, it is supported by Mermaid. It's a lot newer than UML though, but this one does come from UML. And it's the one I definitely use the most often. Um, I use it for two things. Well, two use cases, I would say. The first one, which you can see on the screen is understanding kind of interactions between services in a flow. I'll talk through the flow um, in a second. And the second one, you can use it for classes. So I'm sure we've all been there where you're, I don't know, trying to work out why you've got a bug. And you're kind of looking through the code, you're kick, clicking through class after class after class, and you're getting a bit lost of which class is calling which class because they're all open your tab and you can't remember which way kind of order of execution is going, you're jumping back and forth. I find it really helpful if I'm getting a bit lost or if someone else is not understanding how the code is working to draw a sequence diagram. Um, and along the top, rather than saying sign up service, you'd have the class and the lines between them would be the, the, the messages passed between um, the classes. And on the left, um, again, you have the mermaid markup that generated the entire of this diagram. So this one's not a snippet. This is all the markup that was needed to generate the diagram on the right. And to briefly walk kind of kind of through it, you have you know, a, you know, the user in a browser. They, you know, they want to sign up, so they're going to the sign up page, which is on the sign up service. It returns the HTML page. They submit the form, which is post request. It validates the input. And then you have kind of a split in path where it is invalid, it returns an error. Whereas if it's valid, it will send a post request to the user service. And then it will return to one and it will redirect the login page. Um, you can ignore Kafka on the right. That's um, it's, it, this base that I took straight out of the book. And it in later versions of this sequence diagram, Kafka gets included. Um, so that's just, just why it's on there. The next one and the final one um, might cover the tree diagram. So this is a flow chart um, and it's kind of mermaids catch all for diagramming. And you can basically create any type of diagram you like. So the first diagram I showed you, the C4, there are two ways to do a mermaid. More recently, it's added support natively to C4 using actually plant UML syntax, um, which I'm not a huge fan of. So I prefer to create mine with flowcharts. I think they're a bit more versatile, they look a bit nicer. And this is obviously just a kind of, I don't know, you could almost call it like business logic in this case. So you, like flowchart, you know, this is like a decision node and so on. I used this a lot at my prior company where it was a company that basically gave loans to consumers and there was a big decision engine. And when we were first building that out, we had to build over a hundred different rules and it was getting, it was difficult to sometimes understand the rules because they were quite complex with different branches. So. Yeah, imagine this is just one decision, right? If you've got more than 500 pounds, it's, it's splitting. But some of those rules have you know, 10, 20 decision points in them. So we ended up just the product manager, maybe their software engineer would create a diagram for each rule. There'd be a card for each rule. You could kind of just pick it up and you could basically just turn the diagram to code. And it was obviously 
super simple to do, super simple to um, understand. When it came to testing, it was really simple to test the rule because you could see all the kind of paths and all the things you need to test as a test engineer. And then at the bottom, you have the kind of flow chart syntax um, at the bottom. So why is Mame better? Or why do I think I mean, it's better at least than, than Plan UML and everything else that came before it? So literally anyone could create them in their, in their browser with no installation because it's JavaScript. So I can literally just open mermaid.live, which is mermaid's live editor. On the left, you have the kind of mermaid markup. And on the right, you have the, the diagram that's been generated and you can just update this. So if you look for uh, the, the DOM in the middle, if I just change this to actually, it updates in real time. This is super useful for if you're pairing with someone and you, you know, we talked about the sequence diagram, understanding code or flows. You can just quickly draw a sequence diagram, a throwaway diagram, um, and you can you kind of use that in that moment and then just throw it away. Uh, it's super useful for, for collaboration. Nope, yeah, skip my slides. Uh, literally anyone, anyone, anyone can use this. As I explained, the product manager um, where I work uses this. My last company, product manager, also used it. I've seen test engineers use it. Um, People can just pick it up and use it because it's just so easy to use. It also has a lot more buy-in from the, the industry. When I talked about Plan UML being written in Java, it kind of stunted its growth in that if you're GitHub, GitLab, if you're a you know, Jira, Alaskan products, whatever it is, supporting Plan UML is, is more difficult because it's, there's no more hurdles to using it versus Mermaid, you can just render it in the browser. So, you know, when I talked about like the Atlassian products, if you use Trello, for example, um, it just it just renders in the browser, super simple. And all the other ones do the same. Similarly for IDE plugins, um, all the main IDEs have plugins for Mermaid, and to be fair, mostly for Plant UML, they do have them too. Um, but if you don't have Java installed, then the, the Plant UML one's not gonna work. It has a thriving open source community I think last time I checked, there's a long list of contributors. It has, I think, 55,000 stars on GitHub and 17,000 projects using it. It's, it's, yeah, I think it's, it's just really popular. And ultimately, um, don't worry about the layout or focus on the content. So you may have used Miro or Draw.io or Visio, any, any of these manual tools. Um, they're incredibly time consuming to, to create diagrams with, um, and Mermaid is just gonna just gonna speed you up. It's gonna make you faster. The other big benefit, and this comes with the industry buy-in, is if you wanted to generate a diagram um, using any of the manual tools I talked about, or even Plan UML, and you wanted to store that diagram in, let's just say, a project readme, you would need to export the image, screenshot the image upload it to your repository and push it remote, which works perfectly fine. That will get you the image. When everyone, no one views the markdown, that will see your image, see the uh, diagram. But you've now disconnected the source of the diagram from the, the output. And you'll get the classic case of, you create the diagram, you then put it in GitHub and you want to update it. But I, Guarantee you probably would have lost the mermaid markup at that point or the plant your mum up, wherever it is. With GitHub, for example, you can put it in the markdown, commit it, push it, and GitHub will just render it for you because they have full more mermaid support. And that was a huge one for me. Same for GitLab, same for the Latin products, they all, they all support mermaid out of the box. Um, you can preview it in your, your IDE and it just keeps the source close to where it should be, which is also close to the code. The other big benefit of that is it's diffable. So if you've ever looked at you know, a Visio file, it's XML or it's JSON, you, you basically can't diff it. It's, it's made for a machine, not for a human. Therefore, using Mermaid, like you saw, the, the markup is super simple. And if you changed a word, it would be you know, in the diff, someone can prove it, 
it's all done. And the other classic is you can store these things on Google Drive, but if someone leaves, their, uh, their Google Drive might go with them. Again, you lose that diagram. So hopefully by now, I've convinced you that you should give them a minute to go. And so if you want to give it a go, it has really good documentation. They've just redone their document site. Um, it has loads of examples. It explains all the syntax you can use. And similarly, you can find it on um, GitHub. So how to install the CLI, um, how to get started, how to contribute, all that good stuff is on there. And also, if you want to take it a step further um, and you, you, know, you play around with Mermaid, you want to give it a real good go, um, I have a book, as we mentioned earlier. Um, and it, it's not just a guide on using Mermaid, it overlays creating software with Mermaid. So some of those use cases I talked about, architecture, we talk about domain models, database design, sequence diagrams, everything we've talked about here, plus more um, in the book and how you can do that with Mermaid and how you can integrate diagrams in your everyday workflow. It's available on Amazon. Um, I'll pop the links in the chat worldwide. And this week, the Pragmatic Programmers, who are the publisher, it's their spring sale. So if you use the code dataflow2023 on the Pragmatic Programmers website before Sunday, um, you'll actually get a half price um, in ebook format. So if you want a physical copy, you have to buy it from Amazon or a retailer. But if you want an ebook, it's available right there. And if you have any questions, queries, you want to talk about anything, diagramming, any software engineering, I'm always happy to chat. And my, my Twitter's there and my, my email's there. And that's it from me. So if there are any questions, happy to answer any. Awesome. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I really liked it. I learned a bunch of, a new, a bunch of, a bunch of things. Any questions you want to throw into the chat? And while we're waiting for that, don't run out and buy a book yet because you might be one of the lucky winners tonight. Um, after I give a 10 minute, 15 minute talk here around some of the, around these pieces, um, we're going to auction auction off. We're going to raffle off some stuff. I assume there's an extension VS code. Good point, Clem. That's going to be my there bonus. Is round. There is a deed. Uh, there is a few. So I will put the, the best one in the chat. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, I'll show you some stuff in a minute about that. Um, yeah, I really like what you had to say about it. I was there when UML was invented, and we thought it was the coolest thing since sliced bread. You know the name Grady Bush? I'm sure you do. Maybe, maybe not. Right? So he, yes, he created like, um, what was it? Was it Bush diagrams What his for ADA, for that language? <laughs> and uh, then they merged everybody together, and then it was it became unified markup language with Jakobsen and the other folks, uh, and then IBM bought them at some point. Yeah, they were really annoying to build, but they were really great at communicating. And uh, so I've watched diagramming tools for years. And then when I saw Mermaid come out and the integration level it has uh, to so many things, and like Ashley points out, you know, you, you get a lot of friction points. Like if you do uh, the plant UML, you've got Java, it doesn't go to the web. And then Mermaid pops onto the scene and, it, and they've People have adopted it and they've integrated it. And I'm going to show you some of those integrations. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of a talk. And then uh, Ashley's going to hang on. You have a few more minutes, Ashley? I know it's late. Yeah, I do. I do. My coffee's okay. still kicking in. I was just going to say, you want some more coffee? And um, and then we'll uh, auction that off. So let me share my screen. And see what I can bring to the table. Okay, cool. Um, thanks for putting that in there, Ashley. I don't know if I worked with that one. So just uh, just to piggyback on, I'm going to talk some uh, with what Ashley did. I'm going to talk about Mermaid. And so here is, you know, when I first, not first, but I was really excited when uh, GitHub said they were going to integrate Mermaid into the markdown. So if, if we just take a look at this readme, um, this is up. It's a private uh, repo I have, um, and so here's the mermaid syntax as a fence block, like a fence block piece of code. And instead of you yeah. know, saying, "Hey, yeah, I can't see," oh, that I, it's not showing anymore. It is not. All right, give me a minute. Sorry, I think I lost everything. This is not good. 
Wow. I may not be able to wait. There we go. This has got to be it. You can tell I'm really efficient at Zoom. Okay. Let's try and share the screen again. Okay. Is that? Let me bring up. Okay. So now where's my repo? Okay. So let's back up. So this is what I was. So I really enjoyed the fact that if you put stuff in your markdown and you check it into GitHub, they render any mermaid. So this is some of the stuff that I put up um, and was playing with early on. Um, and then if I, we actually go into the readme and edit it, you can see that it puts it in a fence block, right? And that's similar. Like if you do three back ticks in PowerShell, three back ticks in C sharp, three back ticks. And I guess, I wonder if they render, do they render Perl? I'm sure they do. Um, so you just put your mermaid in, there's your flow chart. Um, and when GitHub gets it, it'll render it into a diagram. So that's really cool. You can edit that in any editor and then you can push it to GitHub. Um, I think Ashley mentioned it was also on GitLab and, um, pretty much anyone they all support this stuff because it's it's just so well used so well adopted so what i want to also show that's the, how you see it and there's a decision tree on goldilocks which i thought was fun um if you where was i going to go with that yeah well we're going to move on sorry um so now let's go we're going to talk about it's not so you saw the uh link that ashley posted that you can get a actual mermaid renderer um Somebody give me a fact check. I think if I open up my markdown and I have a mermaid in my my markdown, the preview in Visual Studio Code, I believe renders it. I don't remember, but I'm not going to try it. Is that true? It, it will do if you have the plugin, yeah. Excellent. Oh, if you have the plugin, gotcha. So not the basic renderer of markdown. You need the plugin. Um, makes me wonder if Azure DevOps renders this. Good question, Dwayne. Would love to hear. I have some of that, but I haven't been up on mine. I've gone to GitHub Actions, so uh, it'd be great to hear if Azure DevOps renders that. Okay, so now what this is, I'm in Visual Studio Code, and uh, am I still sharing? Because <laughs> I don't see my border. Yeah, well, I can see the... the okay, cool, there. thanks. So I'm inside of Visual Studio Code. I've installed something called the Polyglot Interactive Notebook. So they're like Jupyter, but the cool part is, one of the cool parts is they also support things like uh, PowerShell. You can have a PowerShell kernel. You have, cool, you see the Polyglot. You can have an F-sharp, you can have C-sharp running, and they support a lot more. Um, so for example, you can see at the top here, this is actually a markdown cell. If I double click on that, this is the actual markdown that I worked up. It even pulls an image off my local directory um, and it gives me links into other things on the web and if I click render I can see the image some text and if I wanted to I could hover over this and click on it now if I sent this to somebody if I sent it to this to Ashley he could open it up inside of Visual Studio Code if he had um, the plugin in he would get the, exactly this and this is kind of like bundling your documentation with your code so what's really cool is you can have markdown you can have powershell you can have c sharp and then you can have mermaid and that's what i'm going to show next so if you actually i'm going to hover here and i can have an option i have an option to either add code or add a markdown so i'll click on code and i don't know if you see it here off all we're on the right okay it says c sharp if i click on that this is what visual studio code polyglot notebook support okay um here's all the different languages and one of them is mermaid which is really cool so what does that mean I'm, gonna, I'm seeing it available on both Prem and Azure DevOps services. Excellent. So DevOps renders Mermaid fence blocks. So the first thing I'm do. so when I was playing with Ashley's book, I didn't want to go to uh, live uh, Mermaid Live. I didn't want to try. I didn't want to keep checking stuff in. I'm not sure if I had gotten a plugin for the Mermaid rendering. And uh, so I went to one of my favorite tools, which is the, the Polyglot Interactive Notebooks. So here I'm just describing that I'm going to do flow charts, basic syntax, that's uh, in a markdown um, cell. And then here I have a mermaid cell. You can see that off to the right, that is mermaid code. So here's what we would see, right? This is mermaid. If I click the run button, it actually renders it in line. So we'll show a bunch of these. So here's subgraphs. So this is the kind of stuff that you can do. So now what's really cool is I'm actually experimenting and I can save it 
with my notebook, I can pass it around. But this can also, as Ashley pointed out, be describing doing plant UML, C4. Um, and I could be describing large architectures and then drill down even further. And I can actually have code snippets maybe going off to Azure or going off to something else. Um, it's your choice, very flexible. And again, I like the fact that I can render it right here inside of a notebook. Here's another example. I don't know if I took this out of your book or off their page. Um, entity relationship diagrams. Also, what's cool is you can do uh, pie charts, right? So here's the, you create a, a cell, put your mermaid syntax in there, and you can hit run and you get it rendered. And then I think I pull this C4 diagram. So it gets pretty, it can get pretty complex and pretty cool. Now imagine again, passing this off to a, uh, a teammate or somebody else, and they can just go walk through and see what's going on. And they, again, might have markdown up top that describes this a little further or code further down to see what they can uh, actually execute. So um, I think when some people saw me talking with uh, Ashley on Twitter at one point, I don't recall, they were like, hey, is there any tools that work PowerShell with Mermaid? And actually, I think Ashley came back with a couple or one or two. So I just looked at a bunch. I have no opinion on any of these because I have not tried them. Um, these are all the, these are the ones that I found containing the word mermaid up on the PowerShell gallery. So if you want to do an install hyphen module, these are tools that you may want to check out. So what I want to do is a final piece. I don't know how many people here know that I, I'm very much into chat GPT and I've written a, a module called PowerShell AI and um, integrating um, chat GPT at the console. What's really cool is not only does it work in the console, it works in your scripts and it works in, since I'm going to do this uh, with PowerShell as the kernel, it works inside of notebooks. So I also had to write a function because what I wanted to do is I wanted to say, go out to GPT. I'm going to click run here, go out to GPT and I want to give it the prompt, show sample mermaid diagram. Uh, and I didn't want it just to give me the syntax. I actually wanted it to come back and render. Now I'm using GPT-4, so it may be a little slow tonight. So instead of seeing this come back in two, three seconds, it might take 20, 30. Um, they throttle the GPT-4, the newest stuff, because there's just too many people, even though a bunch of us pay. So remember, I'm asking for a show sample mermaid diagram, and it puts it down at the end. Um, and it's almost what I want. I'm going to get right to the pure um, syntax or the mermaid syntax. So I'm going to delete the explanations around and I'm going to run it. So now I was able to generate that with ChatGPT, for example, and I got back what I wanted and I can actually render it in line. We can do other things. This one gets really cool. I don't know how robust it is. So let's hit the run button because this might take 40 seconds. And what I'm saying here in this particular prompt, I'm saying generate a mermaid sequence diagram from these PowerShell functions and what they call just the mermaid syntax, no explanation. It doesn't always get it right. Now, inside the fence block, notice I'm using a fence block for PowerShell. I described two functions, get sales and get orders. Get sales calls get orders and then get orders calls invoke rest method. Okay, so this thing's still running 27 seconds, but like a cooking show, if it doesn't come up, it came back. Uh, I have a prepared one, but let's go down. This is what came back from GPT. So I passed this PowerShell code to the public GPT. And I asked it to say, check out what this is and then render a mermaid syntax so you can show me the flow. Again, I'm, it didn't pay attention to my, I didn't want explanations. So I'll delete that for now and I'll improve my prompt. And uh, this is almost correct, <laughs> okay? Because I didn't have things like get order item and whatnot. We're not going to go down and have a chat GPT converse, conversation, but basically it hallucinated um, function calls that I didn't have. So I need to improve my prompt. That's a little bit on GPT. It's a little bit on me. Um, so it would get it right. But it's kind of cool that you can begin to play and tweak these uh, prompts, talk to GPT, pass your code to it, and then get these really neat um, mermaid diagrams out of it. Once you're there, you can then kick up the notations. You can do coloring so on and so forth. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to show, how you can render mermaid diagrams directly in Visual Studio Code Polyglot Notebooks. Super useful tool, in my opinion. And uh, and then we can plug in 
some of the new features I wrote for PowerShell AI so you can talk to, so that you can run it directly in the in a notebook and actually generate a cell. Questions I saw. So, or perhaps it is saying you need to improve your PowerShell functions. <laughs> That's a good point. I've actually um, asked questions about some of my well-known PowerShell modules and ChatGPT comes back with different names than the functions I made. And I look at it and go, ChatGPT, you're right. That is a better name, but it doesn't help me what I want to do, but it uh, gives me insight to how I'm going to use it in the future. Question, but that's a heck of a start to get a diagram going. Absolutely. So, you know, so this is a mermaid talk. It's a power, it's a polyglot interactive notebook demonstration, and it's a demonstration of chat GPT. Um, this will definitely not replace Ashley. Um, but what this can do for all of us is it can, it, it's a force multiplier, right? So if you can go in and you can start doing these kinds of things, um, you're up, you're up the mountain pretty quickly. So that's all I wanted to show. Anything, any other questions for Ashley or myself? And if not, we've come to the end. And uh, so what we're going to do now is another exciting moment is uh, Ashley has uh, agreed to raffle off a copy of his book. So how we're going to do that is everybody get ready. Get ready to put something in the chat. What I want you to do is we're going to raffle all three books. And the first three people that put their email in the chat, they get a book. Go. All right. Let's see what we got. Wow, Bullis, you're a fast typer. So we got three. We got Greg, Bullis, and Clem. Awesome. Well, congratulations. Everybody else, you got to improve your typing skills. Um, you probably weren't paying attention as I was saying it. So you got to the keyboard late. Um, awesome. So I'm going to get those emails to you, Ashley, and then you can, I guess, pragmatic programmer or you or somebody is going to contact these folks, get them the book. Awesome. I need, I need to type.com better. <laughs> Did you mess up? I'm sorry. Spelling counts. You're out. C-O-M-P. I'm sorry. All right. So I'm going to get these to, uh, to Ashley. Uh, really appreciate everybody showing up tonight. Um, Definitely do join us, join the uh, meetings coming up in uh, May and June, and I'll be doing more chat GPT PowerShell presentations. So keep an eye on the meetup and Ashley, I hope you can come back uh, when your next edition of the book comes out. Sounds good to me. Thank you for having me. Thanks uh, for coming and staying up late. All right, folks, till then, much easier than Visio. Awesome. Glad you liked the presentations. And we'll catch you later. Have a good one, everybody. Bye. Thanks. You're welcome.